How hops and majestic magpies? Welcome to Vignettes and Vigilantes, a podcast dedicated to reviewing films of all genres and episodes from the DC animated universe. I am your host, RK Muse, and today we will be looking at the 1983 crime drama classic Scarface, directed by Brian De Palma and starring Al Pacino in one of his most famous roles. Scarface is a tale of a man who dreams of notoriety and living the high life, both literally and figuratively. Unfortunately, there are many obstacles for him to overcome, and he is besieged not only by company politics, but by his own personal issues. The film opens with a sinister synthesizer explaining the history of the Mariel boatlift. According to this opening crawl, thousands of Cubans fled the totalitarian rule of Fidel Castro by escaping to Miami aboard makeshift boats and ships. Unfortunately, over a fifth of these refugees happen to be criminals, described as the worst of Castro's jails. The cast and crew are then introduced as the synthesizer grows slightly peppier, which is intercut with real-life footage of Cubans reaching the Floridian coast. As the historical footage fades away, we are introduced to our prickly protagonist, Antonio Montana, Tony to his amigos. Tony is being briefed by immigration officers, who quickly deduce that he was a criminal based on his tattoos. They are curious as to how he learned English and speaks it so well. Tony admits that his father was an, an American who took him to movies where he picked up the language. He mentions that he was a member of the Cuban military and has never been in prison or a mental hospital. The immigration officials also grill him about the scar on his face, asking him if he got it by administering oral favors to a lady. But Tony says the scar came from being in a childhood fight. He also reveals that he was once in jail, showing that he's not above lying to authority figures. Anyway, the immigration officers are not impressed by Tony or by his impassioned speech boasting how unafraid he is of the American government, considering he languished under Castro's crushing rule. Tony is promptly sent to a detention center with his friends Manny, Chichi, and Angel. Manny and Tony are particularly close, having served in the Cuban army together. Before making his way to the shores of the United States, Manny had to make a quick pit stop in Mexico to speak to a mysterious Chilean man about his methamphetamine product. After a few days, Manny reports to Tony that he has been offered a deal that leads to green cards and employment. Manny, Tony, Angel, and Chi-Chi just have to kill a Cuban military general, Emilio Rabanga, as a favor to Frank Lopez, who is a Miami-based drug lord. Manny reveals that Rabanga is being sent to the detention center, and though he worked directly under Fidel Castro, he was eventually ushered out and sent to prison, where he tortured some other inmates to death, including the brother of Frank Lopez. During a period of unrest and chaos in the detention center, Rabanga is stabbed to death by Tony. Everyone in the camp is chanting Libertad before, during, and after the general's close and intimate murder. Not a great day to be a former general named Emilio Rabanga in a detention center. The four men are subsequently given their green cards and their new jobs, which for Tony and Manny means washing dishes and selling sandwiches to the populace. Tony is insulted by his duties, having had bigger and better dreams. Before their hard work for the evening is finished, they are summoned by Frank Lopez's right-hand man, Omar Suarez, who offers them a job unloading a boat carrying marijuana, which would net Tony and Manny $500 each. Tony does not appreciate the offer as the standard rate for unloading weed boats is 1000 but Omar says that the two have to prove themselves if they desire higher wages. Omar's driver, Waldo Rojas, mentions a deal with a group of Colombians. Omar decides to offer them a job obtaining cocaine from these Colombian dealers, which would pay the, the group $5,000. And in 1983, according to the inflation calculator, that would be roughly the same as $13,000 in today's money. But Tony is not going to suck up to Omar just because Omar can offer them a more lucrative position. Omar and Tony will get along like oil and water in this movie, just to let you know. Manny, however, is eager for work and jumps at the chance, pulling Tony along with him. Tony and Manny promptly quit their jobs at the sandwich place, much to the shock and ire of their boss, who now has to close up all by himself. With Chi-Chi and Angel in tow, the four drive over to their job site. Here they are expected to collect the packaged cocaine from the aforementioned Colombians. Tony and Angel go into the apartment while Manny and Chi-Chi stay with the car. At first it appears the deal is going smoothly, led by the apparently gregarious Hector and his stony-faced companion Marta, but things quickly take a turn for the worse when Tony and Angel are held at gunpoint. The two are muscled into the bathroom, and Tony is forced to watch as Angel's body is dismembered by a chainsaw. Hector is scarier with a chainsaw than Leatherface, I swear, and much like Leatherface in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we don't get to see Angel being graphically mutilated, we just hear the screams and see the blood streaks on the walls and in the shower. Eventually, Manny and Chi-Chi, who had been distracted by the beautiful young women of Miami, push their way in and manage to get Tony out of the apartment, though Manny is shot in the arm in the ensuing chaos. They at least remember to bring the cocaine, or, as they call it, the yayo, and Tony personally executes Hector. They do not have much time to mourn the loss of Angel, because shortly after, Tony and Manny report to Frank Lopez's enormous mansion. 
Frank greets them with effusive excitement and cannot stop gushing about Tony and Manny, Tony especially. He views them he views them as go-getters and intrepid businessmen. Tony and Manny are able to shoot the shit with Frank, but Tony is promptly distracted by Frank's lover, Elvira Hancock, played by none other than the electrifying Michelle Pfeiffer in her breakout role. Though Tony is staring at her as though she is Aphrodite herself, Elvira is not at all charmed by any of the men in the house. Frank makes plans to go to the Babylon Club for dinner. Elvira makes a crack that Frank's loyalty to the Babylon would make him an easy assassination target, and Frank, unbothered, says, Who the hell would want to kill me? Don't worry, Frank, that question will not go unanswered. Frank, Manny, Tony, Elvira, and Omar head to the Babylon Club. Frank, garrulous as ever, begins explaining the most important rules in the drug trade. Number one, never underestimate the other guy's greed. Elvira interjects with the second rule, never get high on your own supply. Bored by the business talk and Frank's promise to properly tailor Tony, Elvira goes to dance, asking Tony if he'd like to join her. Tony and Elvira go to the dance floor, where he cordially asks about her. All she reveals is that Hancock is her last name and that she is from Baltimore. Tony offers to be a, finger quotes, friend for her, but Elvira sees right through his act and snaps that she does not want Tony to be her friend. Tony retorts by saying that even though Elvira is a gorgeous woman, she clearly has been dancing the devil's tango in some time. When Tony calls her baby, a livid Elvira tells him to never call her that, but Tony is unperturbed. As Tony and Manny drive home that night, Tony mentions that Elvira is a lot like him because the eyes, Chico, they never lie. Manny warns him about going after the boss's lady, but Tony is already enamored with her and fears no man, not even Frank Lopez. Three months later, Tony and Manny are still working for Frank Lopez. They are hanging out on a lovely beach, having tropical drinks and discussing women. Manny proceeds to tell Tony that cunnilingus is the way to an American girl's heart. Tony is unconvinced, and Manny decides to prove his hypothesis by chatting up a bikini-clad woman. She promptly slaps him in the face, much to the, to the delight of Tony. They go to pick up Elvira for a trip to the track. Elvira is disgusted by Tony's Cadillac, which probably would have fit her standards if it didn't have tiger print lining. Personally, I think it's kitschy in a good way, but Elvira prefers items found when living the high life. And that doesn't include tiger print car lining. Tony takes a detour to a car dealership, and Manny tells Elvira that Tony has his heart set on having a tiger as a pet. Bad idea, and the only person who has had a good relationship with a pet tiger is an imaginative young boy named Calvin. Anyhow, Tony makes a deal on a new car that does not have tiger print interior, and he and Elvira leave the place together. As they get into Tony's old car, he says that he likes her much more than he likes Frank, and the two share some cocaine. But Tony overplays his hand and tries to kiss her. Elvira pushes him off, and the two sit in rather awkward silence. It'll be a while before they're sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. To lighten the mood, Tony pops on her sun hat for her, and she laughs, which was an unscripted scene. Al Pacino did pop on the hat, and Michelle Pfeiffer thought it was funny, and to her credit, she was able to improvise, and the scene was kept in the film. For us, it at least shows Elvira the Ice Queen warming up to Tony Montana. Tony decides to pay his mother and sister a visit. His mother, a woman you would never, under any circumstances, call a biznatch, answers the door looking disappointed. Not the sort of look you would hope to see on a mother greeting her son for the first time in ages. But Tony's little sister, Gina, is much happier to see him, and she gives him a hug. Gina brings Tony up to speed. She is now working at a beauty salon while going to junior college, hoping to one day become a beautician herself, and their mother still works at a factory. Tony says he won't have anyone in his family work a meager job, pulling out fat wads of cash to prove himself. But Mama Montana puts her foot down. She knows that Tony's money is dirty, and she also knows that Tony is nothing but a bum. She tells him that his criminal activities give Cubans a bad name. There is something to be said when you look at Mama Montana's perspective, and Tony recognizes her anger. He walks off without another word. But Gina is desperate to have her older brother in her life, and she pleads with him to continue seeing her. Tony refuses to abandon her like their father did and tells her that he'll always be there for her. Gina promises her brother that she'll try to bring their mother around, and Tony tells Gina to take care. As he gets back into the car, uh, Manny muses that Gina has really blossomed into a lovely young woman, only for Tony to lash out and tell him Gina is off limits. Sometime later, Frank sends Tony and Omar down to Cochabamba, Bolivia to meet with Alejandro Sosa, a Bolivian drug lord who is looking to expand his territory. Omar and Tony are butting heads worse than Batman and the Joker, and this does not go unnoticed by Sosa, who has his men take Omar for a walk. Sosa is impressed by Tony's ardor and hard work and does not seem thrilled by Omar's presence. Sosa then takes Tony on a walk around the compound and tells him that Omar is a snitch for the cops, which does not fare well when you're heavily involved in the drug trade. Sosa then hands Tony a pair of binoculars, pointing out a helicopter in the sky. 
Tony notices a badly beaten Omar in the helicopter, and Omar is pushed out, a noose being the only thing that keeps him from plummeting to his death in the Bolivian mountains. Despite his hatred for Omar, Tony seems momentarily shaken. Sosa warns Tony that the same would happen to him if Tony decides to double-cross him. Tony decides to make a deal with Sosa, agreeing to distribute Sosa's product in the United States, which he does without Frank's permission. Tony returns to the Magic City to an angry Frank Lopez. Frank is understandably angry that one of his best men is now dead, his body probably still hanging from the helicopter. Frank tells Tony that Sosa is nothing more than a snake and that he is not to be trusted. He is also flummoxed that Tony would just take Sosa at his word regarding Omar. Frank demands that Tony stall his deal with Sosa, and Tony sarcastically replies, Okay, boss. This is not the last time Frank will tango with a younger protege and opponent named Tony. Frank tries to regain his authority, but Tony will never again regard Frank as a man in charge. Frank reminds Tony that those who fly low become successful, while those who aim high will meet a quick end. His working relationship with Frank now severed, Tony meets up with Elvira at the pool and takes another stab at charming her, which he does by bringing up kids. Elvira seems to be okay with the idea of kids as long as there's a nurse nearby. Tony says that he likes kids very much, and this will come back, so remember that Tony Montana likes children. He also mentions to Elvira that he is making the right connections and that his street smarts will make him a kingpin, which he would like to do with the right woman at his side. He proposes the idea of marriage and parenthood, but Elvira brings up the question of Frank, which is, you know, the elephant in the room. Tony says that Frank is done and implores Elvira to think about his offer. Elvira appears to give it some thought as Tony leaves for a night at the Babylon Club. Once there, he sees Gina dancing on the floor with a charming gentleman. Tony is furious and goes to confront them, but runs into Mel Bernstein, a crooked cop. Bernstein tells Tony that he is used to receiving special treats from those in the drug trade in exchange for police assistance. He secures some round-trip flight tickets to London from Tony, but Tony is clearly not in the mood to be shaken down completely because he has just spotted Elvira and Frank. He's having a great night. Still, Tony should be relieved that he wasn't buying Bernstein's house by the lake, since Bernstein would probably have a condition in the mortgage that he live in the house with Tony. After this, Tony cozies up to Elvira, much to the ire of Frank. But Frank is clearly like those parents who threaten punishment and never make good on it, because Tony can see right through the illusions. Tony then notices Gina heading to the bathroom with her new boyfriend, who is giving her a sensual posterior massage. But Tony isn't going to allow his sister to smooch with someone new on his watch, so he and Manny beat up the date and send him on his way, much to Gina's anger and disappointment. Tony manhandles Gina in the bathroom, then commands Manny to bring her home. Manny and Gina drive home, and Gina vents to Manny about how Tony treats her like a little kid. Being a grown-ass woman, she does not appreciate his overprotective nature. Manny defends Tony's behavior half-heartedly, saying that Tony just wants what is best for Gina. Gina, however, knows that this is a crock. She says that she knows Manny stares at her with an overpowering sense of yearning. She knows Manny is attracted to her, and she feels the same way about him. Meanwhile, back at the club, a dejected Tony is the only one in the audience who does not enjoy the comedy of Detective John Munch. But there's a silver lining. This leaves Tony observant enough to notice two armed and dangerous hitmen. Tony dodges the shots and takes them out, then calls up Manny and tells him to get ready. Tony has convened a meeting with Frank, a henchman called Ernie, and Bernstein. Tony, slouched forward in a swivel chair, his arm in a sling, and an aggressive scowl on his face, is not at all pleased to see his guests. Frank tries to play it off, but he's not the best liar. Tony accuses Frank of coordinating the assassination attempt. Frank begins obsessively pleading for his life and even offers Elvira to be Tony's lady. For a man who squared off against evil aliens who wanted to blow up the earth, this is just shameful. He admits his role in the assassination scheme and implores Tony to give him a second chance. But Tony is not in a forgiving mood. He orders Manny to shoot Frank to death. Tony then confronts Bernstein, who is cool as a cucumber, and says that Frank wanting Tony assassinated made no sense and that Frank fucked up. Tony knows that Bernstein had a hand in things too, and shoots him point blank. Bernstein goes out with a resounding fuck you, which was nowhere near as awkward as Frank's pleading. Ernie is spared and given a job by Tony. He is definitely going home with a full pair of boxer shorts. Manny and Tony head home, dog-tired from a rough night of killing people, but Tony makes a pit stop at Elvira's bedroom, telling her that Frank is dead and he is now available for marriage. He has also become the key distributor for Sosa's product in the state of Florida. Now that Tony has secured both the bag and the dame, it's time for his 80s montage to begin. Set to push it to the limit, we are treated to shots of Tony and his men storing their duffel bags of drug money, where it will be laundered by a banker named Jerry. 
We also see Tony purchase a garish home with the iconic World Is Yours statue, a beauty parlor for Gina, and uh, also having an extravagant, well-attended wedding with Elvira as his bride. At the wedding, Gina and Manny can't help but make goo-goo eyes at each other, but Tony is too distracted showing off his new wife and his new tiger, chained up and flailing about, to notice that his sister and his best friends are showing some serious mutual interest. Looks like for a moment, Tony was the true Tiger King of Florida. Tony is living the high life and is spending the dog day afternoons at his garish mansion, surrounded by all the riches he dared to imagine. As the montage comes to a close, we see Elvira snorting pyramids of cocaine, looking more anxious with each bump. The pyramids of cocaine are not just for Mrs. Tony Montana, but for the man of the house himself. Tony is arguing with Jerry, who is having a hard time laundering his bundles of cash. He'll continue doing so, but only if Tony agrees to a higher rate. Jerry mentions that the IRS is close to knocking at Tony's door. Despite this and the mentioning of a pending recession, Tony finds Jerry's request outrageous. Once he is dismissed, Manny brings up the idea of using Seidelbaum, another banker, to launder their money, as his rates are not as high as Jerry's. Tony is keeping an eye on the surveillance footage and sees that a cable van has been parked outside for days. He is growing paranoid, which was probably helped by the line of co coke he just snorted. Manny, as always, remains the voice of reason between the two of them and tries to get Tony to mellow out, but to no avail. Some people like to take soothing baths when they are stressed, and Tony is one of them. Only, you know, while chilling out in his bath, he's screaming abuse at his wife, who hurls back anti-Hispanic slurs. While ranting about money and the government, Elvira grows irritated by Tony's F-word carpet bombings. They are clearly not a match made in heaven. And during their animosity, Manny is unfortunately present. It's gotta be awkward for him. He brings up the Seidelbaum deal again and tells Tony that everything has been worked out, but Tony insults Manny's competence. This is when Manny acknowledges that Tony is indeed being a butthole. Manny is not afraid to say this to Tony's face, and Tony shrugs it off. He goes back to watching the TV in his bathtub, completely alone and probably thinking that a nice dessert of cocaine would go over well. While counting their money, no one in Tony's crew is aware that they are being watched via hidden camera by the IRS. Tony is neglected to take the advice of Al Capone's ghost because now the tax man has come to pay his respects. Had Tony's crew just taken Saul Goodman's crash course in money laundering, they would have been made in the shade. But they're not just caught on candid camera. One of their associates is actually an Asian working undercover with the IRS, and Shazam, they are arrested and charged with RICO predicates abound. Tony's attorney, Sheffield, says that even though he got Tony released on bond, the government is working hard for an ironclad trial, and Tony will face jail time regardless of what Sheffield can argue. Tony refuses to entertain the notion of going to jail, despite Sheffield vowing to get him to a reduced sentence, and Manny bringing up that American prisons are nicer than Cuban ones. That being said, it is time for another business trip. At the Sosa compound in Cochabamba, Tony congratulates Sosa on his wife's pregnancy, and Sosa asks about a possible Tony Jr. running his empire. Tony and Elvira are still childless, which seems to be weighing heavily on Tony's mind. Remember that I said that Tony really liked kids? Turns out he really wants one, but we'll get to that soon. Tony meets several of Sosa's associates, and Sosa tells Tony that they are all in trouble, and if they work together, they can easily solve their problems. Sosa says that their troubles can be traced back to taxes and that an anti-drug crusading activist from Sosa's native Bolivia is drawing attention to Sosa's empire. Sosa wants this man executed and assigns this gruesome task to Tony. He wants Tony to work with Alberto, a shadowy figure who speaks limited English and is unfamiliar with the geography of the United States. Tony, having no other option, agrees to Sosa's request slash order. The activist will be in New York and that is where they will strike. Once Tony returns to Miami, he, Manny, and Elvira go out to dinner. Manny tries to talk shop, which would at least keep the mood light, but Tony is in a vindictive mood and begins insulting Elvira's character and her hostile womb. The least he could do is remark that she's got a great ass, so he heard. He implies that her rampant cocaine use has made her infertile, basically going the Christopher Moltisanti route and calling her damaged goods. Elvira, near tears and clearly not in the mood to be insulted, fires back that Tony would be a terrible father thanks to his own drug use and other personal problems. Hint, hint, his anger issues. Clearly, these two are beyond marriage counseling as Elvira then says that she's freeing herself. The luxuries are no longer worth the emotional turmoil. As Elvira leaves the movie with her life, Tony stares with contempt at the other restaurant patrons, telling them that they like to feel superior when they pass judgment to the bad guys like him. Tony makes the trek from Miami to New York to whack the activist. While there, he meets up with Alberto and two of Sosa's men. There is a bomb hooked up to the activist's car that Alberto will remotely detonate. 
Tony shrugs off the immorality of this action, at least until he sees the activist's wife and two children come out of the hotel. The activist himself is nowhere to be found as his wife and progeny are loaded into the car. Tony is immediately nauseated by the prospect of killing two children and an innocent woman, and he tries to get Alberto to reconsider. But Alberto will not betray Sosa's orders and prepares to detonate the bomb. Alberto is no stranger to killing his opponents with bombs, and he's not losing any sleep over killing children. Tony, at the end of his rope, whips out the gat and shoots Alberto in the head, much to the horror and shock of the other two men in the car. Tony pulls over to a payphone and receives two pieces of bad news. Manny hasn't been seen for two days, and Gina is gone. Mama Montana clearly only attempted to contact her hoodlum son because she ran out of options. Plus, Tony has influence in the criminal underworld and has quite a few bruisers who can help him rough up the right guy who might know Gina's whereabouts. Tony goes to Manny's house for help in finding Gina, surprising Manny who is wearing an extremely short satin bathrobe. You might be thinking, what sort of beautiful woman is Manny accommodating right now? And Gina answers that question by belting her own satin bathrobe as she descends the stairs. But rather than an, oh, you're sleeping with my sister response, Tony whips out the gat yet again and shoots Manny point blank in the gut. Gina scampers down the stairs and screams in agony as she holds a dying Manny. Tony is in a fog of anger and confusion, but realizes that he made a big oopsie when Gina proceeds to tell him that she and Manny had just gotten married. They were planning on surprising Tony with their announcement. Tony is functionally speechless as his men load Gina into the car and take a very awkward ride back to Tony's mansion. And nobody notices the goons in dark clothing summoning the Montana mansion, paid for and arranged by Alejandro Sosa. Tony continues to get high, presumably racked with guilt over killing his best friend and surprise brother-in-law. As Tony and company enter the home, he accepts a phone call from the man himself, Alejandro Sosa, who is quite angry. The activist gave a speech at the United Nations, not looking very blown up. Sosa and Tony begin arguing with each other, and Sosa angrily hangs up. Suddenly, Gina enters Tony's office, half-dressed and hysterical with grief. She is also armed and begins shooting wildly, though not very accurately. Tony dodges her bullets, but is unable to dodge Gina's accusations of sibling sexual tension. She believes that Tony wants Gina all to himself, and that's why he murdered her husband in cold blood. Before Gina can collect on her revenge, she is shot to death by one of Sosa's men, who is aiming at Tony. Tony catches Gina before she can fall, and holds her as she dies. Then, with an all-out massacre beginning, Tony decides that he is not going down without a fight. He arms himself with an AR-15 and bursts out of his office with the most memorable line of the film, Say hello to my little friend. Tony sprays the house with bullets, having nothing to lose and nothing to live for. He indeed goes down firing. One Sosa goon sneaks up behind him and shoots him fatally. Tony tumbles over the balcony and lands in the pool, his blood turning the water from a soft blue to a sinister red. As the dark synthesizer score blares, the camera follows Sosa's goon descending the staircase with a view of Tony's statue reminding us that the world is yours. And that sums up Scarface. Let's move on to the personal review, shall we? Scarface covers themes that we are used to seeing with our television anti-heroes. The story of a man who turns to violence and dirty money without much recalcitrance. Tony Montana has always been seduced by the freedom of entrepreneurship in the United States, and for him, selling drugs was how he decided to become an entrepreneur. Tony Montana started off small, but had high ambitions to become the biggest drug kingpin in all of Miami, and his rewards were obvious. That garish mansion, the pet tiger kept chained in the backyard, a trophy wife, a bathroom that looked as though it could have been on the Titanic, and mountains of cocaine. Although, considering his position, that was probably obtained with a handy-dandy employee discount. Tony, at his core, though, is exactly what his mother said he was, a criminal. Tony Montana decided to go after his riches the unethical way, through violence and greed. He was not a hard worker like his mother. In fact, he was someone who wanted to get rich quick. The characters of Manny and Elvira are also interesting in their own regard. If not for the illegal narcotics, Manny would just be an ordinary guy. He and Tony would converse with each other, they'd work together, and Manny would remain the voice of reason in Tony's life but Manny wanting to be just a regular guy, middle management if you will, in the drug trade makes him just as interesting as Tony. Manny seems to be familiar with what could happen if you aim higher than you should. He wants to fly under the radar and he's content with making money that Tony Montana finds insulting. Manny was also always a good friend to Tony. He looked out for him on the business end, tried to keep his nose clean, and only objected to Tony's attraction to Elvira when it was clear Frank Lopez was still in the picture. Manny's ultimate flaw in this movie was his obsession with beautiful women. Tony saw Manny as a cheap womanizer and did not want a person like that charming his sister. But Tony failed to notice that Manny's love for Gina was genuine. 
There was nothing sleazy or putrid about Manny's attraction to Gina. It was entirely mutual, and the two fell deeply in love, the only real romance of the movie. Manny was gunned down in his home by his best friend for a stupid reason, Tony thinking that Manny was sleazy and seduced Gina. Tony did not give Manny a moment to explain, which was all that would have been needed. Tony destroyed his sister's happiness by murdering her husband in cold blood, and this was the beginning of the end for him. Gina detested Tony when he killed her husband and wondered if he just wanted her in an, in an incestuous way, which led to her attempting to kill him, which then led to Sosa's goon shooting wildly and hitting her in the process. Then you have Elvira. Elvira is cool, sarcastic, and impudent. She's clearly looking for sugar daddies, which she finds in both Frank and Tony. Though we never find out why Elvira left Baltimore and how she met Frank, I've always thought that Elvira was the sort of woman who had a rough beginning and decided that the only thing she could do to improve her life was using her body and her good looks. Elvira is a deeply unhappy woman, unfulfilled with both her relationships. She is dismissed as a woman who spends all her time dressing and undressing by Frank and berated as a woman who is unable to produce a child by Tony. Elvira uses cocaine as an escape, but we never get to see her being truly happy. Elvira is not a tight-fisted woman and ultimately a logical one like Skylar White, and she is not a hypocrite who is desperate to appear high and mighty like Carmela Soprano. Elvira is a woman who ignores the horrors that surround her life and never confronts her true emotions until the end. Elvira is seen as a trophy wife by the characters in the audience, and that is how she carries herself. The only time we see Elvira be authentic is at the end of the movie, when she declares it's time for her to leave. She finally acknowledges that her life is unfulfilling, dangerous, and toxic. Elvira may be seen as a sex object by this film, but she leaves with her dignity intact. She survives the fate Gina met, which could have easily happened to her. My favorite moment from Scarface may be a bit of a cliche, but it has got to be the ending. Many significant characters warn Tony about biting off more than he could chew, and it finally pays off here. Tony has lost everything. He is all alone and has no one to blame but himself. He has lost his best friend, has ruined his relationship with his sister, and there is no one left who truly cares for him. But Tony does not have a come-to-Jesus moment, and he doesn't die an overly cinematic death. He is shot in the back by a nameless goon and falls into the pool as though he were a crazy 88. It is a bittersweet moment because even though Tony is hard to love and not the best role model, you think of the others who have had their lives tainted and ruined by Tony. Tony dying is not going to reverse the damage he caused, and he does not get a chance at redemption. He never gets to see the light or recognize the error of his ways. He dies without much dignity and his home is left in ruins. Another scene that I like in particular is when Tony executes Frank and Bernstein. Frank grovels and begs for his life in a way that Tony finds pathetic. He is gunned down by Manny. Tony did not even see Frank as a person he should kill. It was beneath him. Tony does kill Bernstein, who is not afraid to swear at Tony. Bernstein does not whimper and beg, but he stands his ground and dies similarly to Tony, silently falling to the ground. This scene becomes slightly humorous when Tony offers Frank's henchman, Ernie, a job right off the bat. Ernie thanks Tony profusely for the job because what else can he do? It's a kind of scene that I think counts as dark humor. Imagine seeing your boss get whacked and his murderer goes, Hey, I like your style. You're hired. You can't say, No thanks, I've got something else lined up. All you can do is ingratiatingly thank your new boss and go about your business. The last notable aspect of the film that I'll mention as one of my favorite scenes is when Tony first meets Sosa. Sosa lives in Cochabamba, Bolivia, which coincidentally is where my dad was born, so I always get a little rush when I see Cochabamba, Bolivia spelled out on the screen. And in terms of dream houses, a Spanish-style home like Sosa's is number two for me, right behind a classic Victorian house with turrets. I love everything about the Cochabamba setting. Just in general, the picturesque beaches, the mountains, the Art Deco buildings of Miami, the neon lights, everything about the setting of Scarface is what I associate with the Floridian urban scene. Now, Florida is a state that has been clowned in the media, and for good reason. Crazy shit happens in Florida. But I love the Miami setting. It's a summery paradise that has darkness running through its veins. I firmly believe that Scarface is the best Brian De Palma film ever made. There has been heavy criticism directed towards Al Pacino for his Cuban accent. I can't comment on this because I'm not Cuban myself, but I can say that he manages to keep up with this accent throughout the film. He never slips into his native New Yorker tongue, and that's dedication to a role. That's probably why the guys on The Sopranos say get into character like Al. The supporting actors in this film are fantastic too, particularly Michelle Pfeiffer and Steven Bauer. Michelle Pfeiffer came into this movie after Grease 2, which probably wasn't that good of a movie, I haven't seen it, and although she seems to regret having starved herself for the role, she still gives an impressive performance, especially in her final scene when she and Tony are arguing about the issue of childbearing. 
Michelle Pfeiffer is just really good at emotional outbursts. She blew me away with Batman Returns, and her ability to subtly and obviously play Elvira's wounded disgust after Tony tells the world that her womb is hostile is something that should not be overlooked. Furthermore, Stephen Bauer plays an effortlessly suave and charming individual, but he is also able to come off as sleazy and obnoxious. Towards the third act of the film, he's able to play Manny's irritation with Tony's antics convincingly well. He and Tony are best friends who have been through the wars, literally, but he still finds Tony's behavior off-putting. Robert Loja is iconic as Frank Lopez. I've been a fan of his ever since I saw Oliver and Company as a kid, and I loved his time on The Sopranos as the angry and explosive Feech Lamana. Yet in Scarface, he's sort of a loser. He might be in charge of the Miami drug scene, but he does not get much respect from Tony and Elvira, and when he is murdered, no one is willing to avenge his death and keep Tony from taking over, and his groveling, it was perfectly pathetic and played well. And it would also be a mistake not to mention F. Murray Abraham and Mary Elizabeth Mastriantonio as Omer and Gina, respectively. Abraham is slimy and snake-like as Omar, and he has great chemistry with Al Pacino in a tense, hate-filled way. He always turns over a good performance, whether he's a criminal or when he's having beef with Mozart. Mary Elizabeth Mastriantonio will always be made Marian to me, but I love Gina. She had so much potential and still wound up in a dark place, but I think Gina ended up losing the most. She worshipped Tony and fell head over heels for Manny. Within a couple of short hours, she lost her husband in a senseless murder, and her idolization of her brother was decimated. She went out trying to kill Tony, convinced he wanted her in a carnal way, and she just became another corpse. I think Master Antonio did a phenomenal job as Gina, and I liked how she and Stephen Bauer played off each other. Their, their romance was convincing to me, at least, and I was sad to see both of them go. Scarface is, without a doubt, one of the most definitive crime films of the 1980s. It was the most profane film, at least before Scorsese released Goodfellas, and it has influenced rap and hip-hop to this day. It is often regarded as one of Al Pacino's best films, and it continues to be iconic in itself, even today. And much like Goodfellas, I can't help but chuckle a little when I watch Breaking Bad. I mean, Jesse Pinkman says, who do I look like, Scarface? And lo and behold, Stephen Bauer himself makes an appearance as Don Eladio in Breaking Bad, in the same scene as Jesse himself. Makes you think, did Jesse ever watch Scarface after that episode of Breaking Bad and think, man, he looks exactly like that guy I cooked meth for in rural Mexico. Food for thought, or yayo for thought, I don't care what you do with your downtime. And that concludes the synopsis and my personal review of Scarface. I will see you in two weeks with a DC Animated Universe episode review. Feel free to follow my Instagram page, which is r.k.musethewriter. I will also upload each of my episodes to my YouTube channel, Vignettes and Vigilantes, so feel free to subscribe. No judgment here. Try not to let the power of running an illegal narcotics ring get to your head. This has been RK Muse with Vignettes and Vigilantes, flying off with the other magpies.